بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome all of you here this morning and thank you for taking uh, the time out of your busy schedules uh, to be with us In this little while that we have together, I don't want to simply lecture to you, but I want to speak to you as a father. Alhamdulillah, I do have four children of my own, teens and now some of them in their 20s and I'm even a grandfather. So when I speak to you on this topic, I'm quite passionate about it because I know the challenges of parenting. I've been through them and I continue to go through them, just as many of you, uh, just as many of you are going through them. Do not feel shy to interrupt and ask any questions, even as I may still be speaking. Don't be shy to contribute if you have any thoughts, even while I'm speaking. It's not, uh, it's not something that formal that we want to, uh, we want to keep everybody quiet for the duration. Uh, that I am up here. In any event, I have given you uh, a questionnaire and it is just something to get us thinking. So if you would be kind enough to fill those out and then we will collect them in a few minutes and during the break perhaps I will go through them and, uh, and if there is anything that I was not going to address and I see now that it needs to be addressed, inshallah ta'ala, I will do so. Alright? So what we want to do, when we speak about raising children, of course, there are many different aspects of raising children. The fact of the matter is, I think I don't have to fear that when it comes to the physical well-being of our children, we have anybody here who is not looking after them. Alhamdulillah, your children are being fed well, they are being clothed well, if anything happens to them, you are giving them medical attention. There is really no need for me to harp on those because by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, I think we, we have that covered. The area that needs more focus is the issue of raising our children and being concerned about their spiritual well-being, about their Islamic well-being. One who looks around today, yes, alhamdulillah, we do see a great deal of good, but we also th see things which are quite concerning. And perhaps that is a sign of the times, but that doesn't mean we have to go with the flow. Remember that the Prophet ﷺ did tell us that Islam came about as something very strange and it will return in a similar fashion. So yes, when you and I strive to raise our children to be first and foremost good Muslims, many people will look upon us and think that we are backwards, they will think that we are weird, that we are strange. But as the Prophet ﷺ says, Tuba lil ghuraba. But there are glad tidings for the strangers. Right? Because we are not concerned about what the people think. We are worried 
about the ultimate well-being of our children and this is what we're going to discuss in just a short while. Let me begin by reminding myself and the rest of you of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. So when it comes to raising our families, raising our children, looking after one another, the primary goal is the akhirah. We are not saying that we only think about the hereafter and we don't worry about anything in, you know, in, in the life of this world. But I think we need to get everything in perspective. The life that we are leading now is a pathway to the eternal life in the hereafter. And the outcome, if you will, or how we will end up in the hereafter really is dependent on how well we do here in this world. So we need to be cautious and careful and always remember the purpose of our being. In general, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ This is the primary purpose of our being. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala created us and He placed us in this world and what he expects of us is to worship him and without getting into any great details of what worship is I do want to say that worship is not restricted to the masjid worship is not restricted to the month of Ramadan when we speak of worship we speak of it in a very broad manner basically to live our lives every aspect of our lives in a manner that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way I do business, if I'm conscious and aware of what pleases Allah and what displeases Allah so that I can do those things which will please Allah and I can avoid those things which displease Allah, this is ibadah. When I go to sleep, if I think about how the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to sleep and what to say before sleeping and so on and so forth, my sleep becomes an ibadah. So it's not restricted to only those formal acts of worship, but alhamdulillah, ibadah is, is very broad. So we have been created to worship Allah, and another way we can put it is to live our lives in a manner that is pleasing to Allah. This in a general manner. Tayyib. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you see here in Surah at tahrim He says, Tabaraka wa ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. So he is addressing each and every one of us. Those who claim that we believe in Allah. Those who claim that we are going to be meeting Allah and answering to Him for all that we have done here. So now we have to pay attention. He is addressing us. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu u anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. This is what it is all about. Protect yourselves and your families from a fire. And of course, here the fire means the fire of Jahannam. وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ Whose fuel is people and stones. عَلَيْهَا مَلَائِكَةٌ غِلَاظٌ شِدَادٌ لَا يَعْسُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ So here it's clear. The number one priority when we are raising our children is to raise them in such a way that we will be concerned about their ultimate well-being. It's fine and dandy that we want our kids to be successful here in the sense that, you know, they are not going to be beggars. They will be contributing members to society. This is what we want. But contributing only in materialistic ways, sadly, of course, this is the view of many. My child is going to be a doctor. My child is going to be an engineer. We're not against that. But I ask you, if your child had many degrees, leave alone just one degree, PhDs and so on and so forth, but they didn't pray to Allah, they were not good to you, their parents, they lived as any non-Muslim would live. Is that really success? It is success in a very materialistic way 
But in the real sense, it is not success. I am all for education. However, let's say for the sake of argument, you had a choice that your child would be unlettered, illiterate, couldn't read or write. But would be like many of those out there who are not concerned about their deen. Religion doesn't matter to them. But they are wealthy. They were able to get fantastic jobs because they are so highly qualified. Or, as I said, you have a child who is unlettered, but alhamdulillah, regular with the salah, good to you as their parents, etc., etc. Which of the two would you prefer? Of course, the mu'min, the believer will prefer the latter. Not that we're saying we don't want them to be educated, but I said if there was a choice between the two, it's a no-brainer. Because the second, insha'Allah, will take my child to Jannah, where we will live with them, bi'idhnihi, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, Allah Jalla wa ala is telling us, protect yourselves and your households and your families from that fire. The fire of Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from that fire. And may He subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to raise our families in such a way that we will have protected them from the hellfire as well. When it comes to the issue of our families, then we need to rest assured that it is a great burden. It is a huge responsibility. The Prophet ﷺ told us that all of us, when it comes to our relationship with each other, are as shepherds. In that long hadith, we are told about how the Imam, you know, the ruler, and we don't understand it as only the ruler, but even people in, in, in power, in, in positions of authority, whether you be a manager at your workplace or you be uh, a supervisor whatever it may be these are all positions of authority you are responsible for those beneath you the man is responsible for for his entire household the woman is responsible for the home of her husband and so on and so forth kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi now the word mas'ulun and the word su'al, they come from the same root. Mas'ul means you will be questioned. We translate it loosely as being responsible. But mas'ul means you will be questioned. Wa kullukum mas'ulun. That is on the day of qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you. He will ask you about those whom you were responsible for. So you and I as parents will be asked by Allah according to this hadith as to how we raise our children. I want you, as I would like myself, to think about this. What do you think Allah is going to ask us on that day about our families? Did you provide the most luxurious home that you could for them? Did you put them through the best possible university you could find for them? Are these questions that you really think are going to be asked on the day of Qiyamah? Or do you think we're going to be asked about why our kids did not pray, for example? Why they didn't know the basics of their deen? There's an interesting story that took place with Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda where a father came and complained to Umar radiallahu an about his son. And so Umar radiallahu an summoned the son and asked him, what is the matter? How come you are, you, you are so disrespectful towards your father? And do you know what the answer of the son was? And this is an eye-opener and it is something for us to think about because this may happen to us on the day of Qiyamah. 
The son responded by saying, Ya Umar, before, Ya Amir al muminin before I could, I could behave badly towards him, he behaved badly towards me. He didn't teach me what it is to be a good son. He didn't train me to be a good son. In other words, what you and I are learning from this is that before we are asked or be, I should say before our children are asked about how they behave towards us, we will be asked about how we raise our children. This is a scary thought. It's easy to blame kids, but who raised those kids? Who was responsible for the way that they, that they turned out? It is me and it is you. Allah Jalla wa'ala brought them into this world through us. Children are an amana. Children are a responsibility. And let me, let me tell you another incident that took place between, uh, between a man and a scholar. So this man comes in and says to the scholar, Ya Sheikh, I have good news. My wife has given birth. We have our first child, Awsini. Give me some advice. What do you think the response of the Sheikh was? I mean, he, he was exaggerating, but he wanted to, to, he wanted to get a lesson across. He said, your wife gave birth and now you're coming to ask me? It's already too late. It's already too late. As I said, it's an exaggeration, but it is to get a point across. The point is this. Parenting begins even before the child comes into this world. Children have rights over us. And I want to stress the fact that before we think about our rights over our children, let's think about our children's rights over us. Before you and I get married, I mean, th this is what the Sheikh was implying, that you should have come to me even before you got married. I would have taught you the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. When you seek out a spouse, seek out someone who is righteous and pious. Seek out someone who is religiously committed. This goes for both parties, for the man as well as the woman. The Prophet ﷺ told the men that yes, you will look for these types of qualities in a woman, but the one that you should focus on the most is that deen the one who is religiously committed. Similarly, when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed the awliya, the, the guardians of the women, said if someone comes and proposes for one of your daughters and you are pleased with his character and his religious commitment, then go ahead and marry them off. Otherwise, there will be a great deal of fitna and corruption. People have a tendency of saying, I don't know what's wrong with my kid. This kid was born a devil. You know, all kinds of things. But we are reminded by the Prophet ﷺ that children are born pure and innocent. No, children, no child is born a devil. No child is born, you know, uh, ill-mannered. No, no. That will all depend on the parents. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitrah. So every newborn is brought into this world upon that fitrah. Think of that child as a piece of clay. And you are the one who molds that child. That child will pick up characteristics from you. Not everything is genetic. There are many things which are learned. So those children will learn from us. Anyways. So the idea is this, we need to first and foremost understand that great responsibility that we have towards our children. But remember this, nothing is ultimately in our hands. The moment we think we can accomplish things because of our knowledge and because of our experience and so on and so forth, 
That is the moment we have gotten ourselves into trouble. Believe me, there isn't a single thing in this world that you and I undertake except that we need the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot accomplish anything without Him. And therefore, Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guide us towards turning to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Begging of Him from the outset. Begging of Him from the time you even imagine having kids to grant us righteous offspring. This is in Allah's hands. And when we talk about granting us righteous offspring, it's more than just, Ya Allah, you know, help me so that my child will be pious. In other words, automatically you'll take care of it. No. It's deeper than that. Ya Allah, grant me and my wife. Ya Allah, grant me and my husband the strength and the ability to raise our children in a manner that pleases you. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. He subhanahu wa ta'ala listens to all our du'as. And although there is nothing wrong with requesting others to do du'a on our behalf, except that nobody will have more ikhlas in their du'a for you than you yourself. Is that clear? I'm the one in need. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ so if you look to the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانْ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So if you look to the Qur'an, you look to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the direction is always for us to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our own. It is fine to ask others, but don't rely on the dua of others. Rely on yourself to turn to Allah because you know your needs better than anyone else. You can be more sincere towards yourself than anyone else. When you pour your heart out before Allah Jalla wa Ala, He listens, subhanahu wa ta'ala. To remind ourselves of our need for Allah, Ya ayyuhan nas, antumul fuqara'u ila Allah. O oh mankind, you are those in need of Allah. Allah is not in need of us. While Allah is free of need. Wallahu huwa al hamid. So we are in need of Allah for every single thing. So from the outset, it's all about us asking Allah Jalla wa ala. There are many du'as, many supplications that we can say. Begging of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us righteous offspring. One of them is mentioned here. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبَلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا In the booklet that was distributed, I think there's a page which has some of these du'as. And you will also find these du'as in books such as Hisn al-Muslim and you know, other books of du'a. But let me say something here. And it is... The dua is not restricted to what you find in those books. Dua is not restricted to those duas that you will find in the Quran. Those are duas that we are being taught. But you can say a dua in your language, in you using the words that are me- most meaningful to you. Imagine when you are in your sujood. And you shed tears before Allah Jalla wa Ala, begging of Him to grant you righteous children. Even before you have children, and after you have children, begging of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to grant you the strength and the wisdom and the ability to raise them in a way that they will be pious and righteous. Be even He Subhanahu wa Taala. So, du'a is the first step. Rabbi habli min as-salihin, another example. But again, as I said, we are not going to restrict ourselves to these du'as 
we may ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way, in any way that we like. Dua is quite open. I said to you a while ago how that Sheikh was responding to his student when he said, it's already too late. Well, perhaps one of the things he was referring to also is not only would he have directed him before he got married on what to look for in a spouse, but then after marrying, what are some of the things that need to be done? So before being intimate with the spouse, there's a dua that we have been taught. Bismillah. Allahumma jannibna shaytana wa jannibi shaytana ma razaqtana. So you want your child to be protected from the shaytan. This is even before the child is born. Before the child is conceived. So this is why the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, when one of you comes to his wife, say this dua. In other words, before being intimate with her. So that should a child be the result of that meeting between the two of you, then insha'Allah, they will be protected from the shaitan. You know what they say, prevention is better than cure. But unfortunately, I think many of us forget about these types of instructions. For some reason, we as human beings, and this is the case with, with, with so many things, even when it comes to protection from the jinn or from black magic or Allah forbid when somebody is afflicted with such things they seem to think the more complicated the solution the more effective it's going to be whereas that is not true at all similarly with this it is not true that the more complicated it becomes the more psychology that you study, the easier it will be for you to raise your children. No, 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 no. It begins with dua. It requires ikhlas. These are practical steps. These are not just theories and ideas. These are guaranteed steps. How can we say that they are guaranteed? It is because they came to us through al-wahi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed from above the seven heavens that we should turn to him and beg of him for all our needs. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he gave us this type of guidance, it was because he received it from Allah jalla wa ala. It is also wahi. Wa ma yantiqu anil hawa in huwa illa wahyun yuha. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam didn't just make these things up. They were revealed to him by Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Now your children are born. You have children. How many of us on a regular basis recite something simple over our children? Look at this dua. The greatest of all mankind used to recite this over his two grandchildren, Al-Hasan wal Hussein. Radiallahu anhuma. If he was doing so, don't you think that we probably have a greater need of doing so? Now the dua as you see it is how it is said if you are reciting over two, over two children. Uridukuma, the two of you. Uh, I, uh, I seek refuge with Allah for the two of you. If you have just one child, for the male you say uriduka. For a female, Uridhuki. And if you have more than two, so that is three or more children, you can say Uridhukum. You know, people do bedtime stories. I'm not mocking any of that. It is fine. We sit and we recite. Alhamdulillah, many of us have the habit of reciting the surahs with our kids before they sleep. Alhamdulillah. But how many of us then take, how long does it say, does it take to say this dua? Uridhuka. Or u'idhuki, u'idhukuma, u'idhukum, whichever one you're going to use. U'idhukuma bi kalimati Allahi tammati min kulli shaytani wa hamma wa min kulli ayni lamma. What, did that take me more than 15 seconds? It doesn't take long. And you know when it's going to work? 
I know I'm taking a long time on this and people may be thinking but I want some practical tips on raising children but this is practical and this is the most effective method when you place your trust in Allah this will work when this dua is not said as a habitual thing in other words it doesn't become something like brushing our teeth before going to sleep but rather every time we say this dua we acknowledge and we realize whom we are turning to and we are confident that Allah is listening to us and will respond to us this is the frame of mind that you and I need to be in when we are saying these type of duas أُعِيذُكُمَا بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَّةِ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْطَانٍ وَهَامَّةٍ وَمِنْ كُلِّ عَيْنِ اللَّامَّةٍ Ya Allah This is coming from the heart You are begging of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them from every single harmful thing from every devil even from physical harms the vermin even from the evil eye from people, people being jealous yes Instead of looking elsewhere and instead of looking for complicated solutions, here is a great solution right here. A daily dose of this dua, imagine what it can do for you and your children. So every day, why not? It doesn't take longer than 15 to 20 seconds for you to say it. You haven't memorized it, so have it printed out. Big deal. Believe me, you'll memorize it after the first week or two. All right, it's fairly, it's fairly simple. When it comes to raising our children, because many of us may not quite understand all that it entails, we live in a world that is extremely materialistic. And so, even before your child is born, you may start now thinking about their education. I don't want anybody to think that I'm mocking any of those things. I am not. But I'm just trying to put in things into perspective. I'm sure it's probably the case here as well. But I know in Canada, for example, it is very common that the moment a couple finds out that the wife is pregnant, they'll go and they'll take out this policy you know there are certain types of insurance policies it's for their education some sort of an education policy I, I, I forget the exact name right now but there are many packages out there so you start contributing from now so when your child reaches university age their education will be taken care of because education is expensive you know, you're looking at a minimum of thirty, forty thousand dollars a year for that child's education. So they start from the beginning. Wow, you know, my child has to go to, through a, a minimum of four years, uh, you know, because the primary education, government education is usually, usually free, but our universities cost money. And they think about the education of the child even before, even before the child is born. Then you have this fear of what's going to happen. We have children and, and who's going to provide for them and we need a bigger home. All of these things may be valid concerns, but they should never be number one on the list. As I said before, number one on the list is the spiritual, the Islamic well-being of the child. The other things, listen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken it upon himself to provide for us and our children. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ And in another ayah, نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُهُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ So don't worry about having children. Allah Jalla wa'ala will look after you. Ultimately, that will be taken care of. بِإِذْنِهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى It doesn't mean you have to be lazy. No, you have to strive, you have to work hard, you have to save, all of those things. But, here what we're being reminded of, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا 
inna min azwajikum wa auladikum adu wallakum fahdharuhum O you who have believed, indeed among your wives and your children are enemies to you. How could your spouse and how could your children be enemies to you? It doesn't mean everybody's spouses and everybody's children are enemies to them. But how is it that they could be your opponents? They could be on the opposite side. That could be the case when in order to please them and in order to give them quote unquote a better life, you are not concerned about how you're going to earn. So you, you will look to haram sources and not think twice. Why? Listen, I, I, have to, I have to fend for my family. I need to provide for them. In order to please our children, and, and you know this happens, especially when the children start getting older and they start becoming quite demanding, and so we think, well, you know, just so I don't lose my children, let me give them whatever they ask for. Well, look at society today and you see what the result of that is. They become spoiled brats. They don't appreciate anything. I'm not saying that about all children, but there are many out there who don't appreciate anything and they end up turning against you. You have to bend over backwards to please them and you doing so very often leads you to displeasing Allah and this is how they become your enemies. So once again, we need to keep everything in perspective. As I said to you earlier, I'm talking about practical means of raising righteous children. Maybe you were expecting a lot of theory and a lot of, you know, psycho babble garbage. I'm not about that. We are looking at the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Then, of course, there are other practical means that we will come to as well. But I'm first going to look at those means that Allah Jalla has directed us towards. Every Jumu'ah, we recite Surah Al Kahf. In Surah Al Kahf, we come across this ayah. وَأَمَّا الْجِدَارُ فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ وَكَانَ تَحْتَهُ كَنْزٌ لَهُمَا وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهُمَا وَيَسْتَخْرِجَ كَنْزَهُمَا رَحْمَةً مِنْ رَبِّكَ وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي ذَلِكَ تَأْوِيلُ مَا لَمْ تَسْطِعْ عَلَيْهِ صَبْرًا So you know the story of Musa alayhi salam with Al-Khadr. Several things happened. And Musa alayhi salam was kind of shocked. What is going on? Right? I mean, why did you kill that child? I mean, in, in, uh, in one of those incidents, Al-Khadr kills the child. And Musa alayhi salam doesn't understand it. And eventually when he explains it to him, he says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that this child would be a source of misery for his parents. And he, tabaraka wa ta'ala, wanted that they have a righteous child. Now they came across this group of people, this community, and they requested of them to be hosts to them. But they were not good hosts. In other words, they turned them away. Go find something on your own. We're not going to feed you. We're not going to look after you. And there was a wall in that village or that town which was going to topple over and Al-Khadr fixed it so Musa alayhi salam is perplexed why would you do them this favor when they were not even kind enough to host us why when explaining to Musa alayhi salam that particular incident he said to him the meaning of the ayah and as for the wall it belonged to two orphan boys in the city. And there was beneath it a treasure for them. So under this wall was a hidden treasure for these two boys. If that wall had toppled over, then that treasure may have been discovered by somebody and stolen. It wouldn't have remained for the boys. But by erecting that wall, by fixing it, 
by repairing it, the treasure was preserved for those boys for when they got older and they could benefit from it. Now, what was the reason behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending Al Khadir to fix that wall? And their father had been righteous. Al Imam ibn Kathir, alayhi rahmatullah, and others, because in the Arabic language, when we say Abuhu, his father, it doesn't necessarily mean his immediate father. It could mean the grandfather, or it could be the grandfather from several generations before. This is why when we speak of Adam, alayhi salam, we say he is, a, he is our father as well. Or our father Ibrahim alayhi salam and so forth. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Some of the Mufassireen say he is referring to the grandfather of those two boys from seven generations before. So before thinking of a savings plan with the bank or the insurance company, here is the best savings plan that you and I can have for our children. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا We can be righteous parents. Our great, great, great cha- grandchildren, many generations later, could be protected due to our piety bi'idnihi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this one of the practical means or not? And it is something we are being directed to by Allah Jalla wa'ala. He's informing us of what happened. So your Lord intended that they reach maturity and extract their treasure. So Allah Jalla wa'ala had that treasure. Even now we're talking even materialistically. You see how Allah Jalla wa'ala takes care of us? Yes. So even our great-grandchildren may benefit from our piety right here and now. So one of the best investments that you and I can make for our children and the generations after is us ourselves. When we hear the call, Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala al-falah, we rush to the masjid. When it is time to pay zakah, we pay our zakah. When we see other Muslims in need, we assist them. We teach our children Quran. We ourselves recite Quran, generally being decent human beings, being decent Muslims. Being righteous doesn't mean that you have to be a scholar and that you have to fit a certain description. No, no, no. Being righteous means that you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of your ability. You live your life in a way that you ask yourself, when Allah questions me about this, I will be able to answer confidently and inshallah be saved and protected from any type of punishment. When we speak of dua again, we see that the Anbiya used to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would respond to their dua. This is why I said before and I will repeat it to drive the point home and it is that when we do turn to Allah in dua, we do so with our hearts. We do so with utmost ikhlas. Not to mock anyone, but you and I know what we see very often. People apparently in dua, even with their hands raised. But what are they doing? You'll see them looking around. Or you'll see them because their phone happened to buzz in their pockets. In dua. But the phone is out, checking the message. Is this ikhlas? Imagine if somebody came to you for help. Somebody came to you, they really needed your help, and you could help them. And... You know, they come to you and they're pleading their case in front of you and why they need your assistance. And in the meantime, they're looking over their shoulders, uh, looking for someone else, reading their messages on their phone. How seriously would you take one of them? How seriously do we expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us when, although we may have raised our hands, and we are just rattling off words, but without any meaning. Our hearts are elsewhere. No, the hearts need to be attached to Allah Jalla wa'ala. When they are, 
inshallah we will be in this situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to us. So as I said, these were some of the, in my view, some of the most important practical means of raising righteous children. Now let's go on and talk about you know, everyday life also. Not that the other stuff is not everyday life. Believe me, if you and I are not reciting a dua for our kids every day, that means we are really not doing a very good job in raising our kids. Because we need Allah's help day in and day out. In any event. When it comes to parenting, what we do need to understand is that it is not only the mom's job to raise kids. In many societies, this is what we, this is what we tend to assume. The dad is to go out and work and the mom has to take care of the kids. And in many cases, even if the mom is working and the dad is working, still at the end of the day, the greatest expectation is still from the mom. But remember that hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, and the man will be asked about his entire household. So he's in first place in terms of responsibility. Husband and wife must work as a team. We are in this together. There's no such thing as us competing against one another when it comes to raising our kids. It is important that we're both on the same page. We want the same things for our children. These things have to be discussed. They will not happen automatically. And I have many cases where once the child is of school going age, then the mom and dad sit together and they talk about, uh, okay, so what kind of school do you think we should send them to? You want to send them to a government school, you want to send them to an Islamic school, and now the fight begins. I mean, don't you think this is something you should have discussed long ago? The pros and cons of both, the availability of the two of them, the affordability, all of these things need to be discussed, but they need to be discussed long in advance. Then you come, and believe me, right up until this day, I still have people coming to me and, you know, a dad will say to me, listen, I mean, you know, I hope you guys do a good job because, you know, my wife is dead against this. It's, you know, on my insistence. Now, if we don't see any results, she's going to say, I told you so. You know, and things of that nature. So, how come? It's not a competition. It's teamwork. So, we need to be on the same page. All right? Uh, As with any company, let's say, or any business, when there are partners involved, sometimes in order to make things more efficient, it works if we delegate responsibilities. You are in charge of a certain area. You are in charge of a certain area. There's nothing wrong with that. Not that the other one has no responsibility. It is just that, you know, kids, as they grow, they become smarter and smarter. They learn, I don't know how, but they learn how to play us against one another. They learn sometimes that dad is really soft when it comes to the candy department. And mom is really soft when it comes to the sleepover department. So if I want to go here, if I want to go there, I'll go to mom. But if I want candies, I go to dad. Right? So... Husband and wife, they need to lay down certain ground rules. This is going to be our policy. So it's not as though one is going to make the decision without the other knowing. We both have decided, between the two of us, that we will allow certain things and we will not allow certain things. So if our son or daughter comes to me, the dad, and asks me, I will have the same answer as you, the mom. Although, as I said, there's nothing wrong with saying that, listen, I'm going to refer the kids to you whenever it comes to X, Y, and Z. 
When it comes to A, B, and C, you refer them to me. Those who are parents understand because in certain areas you need to be a lot more firm and in some cases mom is more firm than dad and in other cases dad is more firm than mom. Right? So they need refer whatever mom says, I agree. Whatever dad says, I agree. Alright, so there's nothing wrong if we do uh, distribute, if you will, these responsibilities uh, among us. The next point is speaking about when our kids get older. One of the biggest mistakes that parents make is that if they disagree on something, they start arguing in front of the kids. This is where shaitan plays a big role in teaching the kids. Oh, you see, they don't agree. So, the child is listening and will figure out that you guys can't see eye to eye on this. So in that particular matter, they're going to go to this parent which has the opinion that suits the child. Right? And we see it. It happens all the time. And therefore, it's important for us not to disagree in front of the children. Also, we are speaking here about disciplining. Uh, never disagree about discipline in front of the children. Right? So, uh, if the child has done something, and you need, you need to discipline them. And discipline, of course, doesn't mean beating them till they're black and blue. This is not what discipline means. It means that you're going to find some means of teaching that child that what they did was wrong. And that may be by taking away something from them. We'll talk about that a little bit later, بإذن الله تعالى. Okay? Uh, so we want to just remind ourselves that parenting is teamwork. And we don't want that one parent or the other is always responsible for discipline. Because then the child will look at the parent as, that particular parent as the bad guy. Right? We'll start disliking the father because the father is always the one who is doing the disciplining. Or may dislike the mom because she's always the one doing the disciplining. So you, we need to share it out and we need to make sure that the kids get uh, the right message. All right. Um, we're going to discuss now before we break the importance of environment and the importance of setting a good example and I think these things are quite obvious to all of us let me simplify things from the outset by reminding every one of you that you as the parent are your child's first hero in this life. When a child looks at mom and dad, you mean everything to them from day one. You are their hero. You can never do anything wrong. Remember, they're very young. So as far as they can see, wow, you know, the, mom is number one. There can't be anybody better than mom. There can't be anybody better than dad. And you can see it put into action by the way they imitate us. When we talk about environment and we talk about setting an example, they start imitating us from a very young age in all sorts of things. Many of you who are already parents Witness that. They might even imitate the way that you hold the phone. They want to hang on to something and pretend that it is a phone and that they are, you know, texting and messaging people because they see you do it all the time. They're doing it because they've seen you do it. When you stand for salah and your two-year-old daughter quickly rushes and tries to put on a hijab and join you. Why? Because she wants to imitate you. She sees you doing this. Our children, before they can even speak, when they see us recite Qur'an, I had it with my own kids, you see them sitting next to you, they don't even recognize a single word of the alphabet. They're like two years old. Right? And because you're reciting Qur'an and you know, by that time, maybe maybe some of them know Al-Fatiha or some of the words of Al-Fatiha, but they don't know Qur'an. 
But you see they move their lips and they may say words, they, they, they don't mean anything, but they're trying to imitate you. Why? Because you're reading Quran and they want to do as mom is doing. They want to do as dad is doing. Our kids will imitate us. And you notice on the bottom of every one of these slides, it says children learn what they live. And I usually extend it and I say that for the most part, they will then live what they learned. And, you know, many uh, studies have shown uh, people who in their lives end up being violent. You know, people who are violent towards their wives or who are violent towards their, chil their children. They pick that up from their parents because they were raised in that environment. It was ingrained in their minds. And so to them, this is normal. And they repeat that behavior. All right? The home environment. Remember that hadith again. Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitrah. Every child is born in that pure and natural state. We have a tendency of telling kids to do whatever we say. And not to do what we do. And of course, actions speak louder than words. So, if a parent is telling their kids not to smoke, for example, because it kills and it's so harmful and so on and so forth, and then they see their parents smoking, what, what kind of message is this sending the child? And the child asks, but daddy, you smoke, how come? Just do what I say. Don't worry about what I do. That is not going to be meaningful at all. As long as you're doing it, then it must be all right. And so the child will end up doing something similar. Okay, as we said earlier, remember that you and I, as parents, are role models for our children. They need to observe and they need to see us from the beginning. Praying and being respectful and using good language and having good manners and so on and so forth. And you know, I think sometimes about the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wherein he says, salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi, that the best salah, so for men in particular, praying in jama'ah, in the masjid, the fara'id, this is the best thing we can do. But after praying the fara'id in the masjid, which is the best salah that a man can offer? In other words, the nawafil or the voluntary prayers, is it best to offer them in the masjid or in the home? At home. There's nothing wrong with offering them in the masjid. But he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to offer the voluntary prayers in the home is better than in the masjid. Okay, there are many, many reasons for that. But when I ponder over that hadith, and I relate it to child rearing, I think, yes. Because if you have children, and they see you praying in the home, then you are setting an example for them. Your children see you offering salah in your home. You're always in the masjid, you pray and you come home, they don't see you pray. Maybe they see mom pray, but it is important that they see both mom and dad pray. And so when you come home and you pray your nawafil, you pray your sunnah at home, mashallah, tabarakallah, the kids are going to pick up on that. And I cannot emphasize enough that whole concept of actions speak louder than words. We can talk until we are blue. But if our kids don't see us walking the walk as we talk the talk, it is not going to have an impact. If they see us doing certain things, they will become accustomed to them. They will want to pray. They will want to recite Quran. Our kids will want to go to the masjid. Where are you going, Dad? I'm going to the masjid. Oh, I want to go with you. It's wonderful when the child is, is crying to, to, want, to join you to the masjid. This is something that you want. That they love that masjid. We speak about good manners. Ah, here's a big one. There are many of us who outside the home, anybody who sees us will think that we're an angel. Everything is please, thank you. There's all this politeness. 
uh, may I offer you something? You know, you won't eat before somebody else eats. You don't drink before somebody else drinks. You know, if they look at you, MashaAllah, it is as though you're an angel who came from heaven. And your kids are watching you and they're like, dude, that's not my dad. Like, who is this guy? Because at home, give me this, give me that. Right? Worried about himself. Of course, it goes both ways. True or not? Therefore, the best of manners are the ones that begin at home. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he tell us? The best of you are those who are best to the people outside. And then, you're sometimes good to your families. He said, your iman can be measured by how well you treat your family. Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. The best of you are those who are best to their families. So those good manners, that politeness and that kindness and that wonderful, you know, welcoming attitude that you have, it starts at home. Who you are is determined what you're like at home before it is outside. Outside, let's be very frank with one another. Very often, people put on a show. They don't want to look bad in front of others. Look, some of them will even tell their kids. You know, if somebody asks you, don't tell them. Huh? If by mistake the kid starts to speak about something that is embarrassing to you at home, you give them that death stare. Right? If looks could kill, they'd be flat on the ground. Because you don't want your secrets exposed. This is the reality of life. For many of us. Therefore, it all begins at home. How are we with our children? You want them to be respectful? Listen, they will end up exactly like us if we are behaving in that fashion. If we are nasty at home, we are abrupt and so on and so forth, but we're only kind outside, oh, they'll think that's the way, that's the way it works. Because they are learning, they are learning what they live. Oh, okay, at home, do whatever you want. But outside, just be the best person ever just so that people will think that you're you're an amazing individual and so forth okay so please let's let's really focus on this there are parents who used to come to me and it's been happening for years you know i don't know where my child got this language five-year-old child and is using the f word for example in more cases than not they heard it from the dad or the mom when they were when they thought they were saying these things under their breath they didn't think the kids could hear them or when an argument was taking place behind closed doors but they didn't realize that the voices were raised so high that the child could hear listen not that we should watch our tongues just because of our kids first and foremost of course we are responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ourselves but then it's another responsibility that our kids, we don't want them to pick up those things from us. Some teachers complain about kids being angry all the time. Do a little bit of digging and you will see that either one of the two parents are like that at home. And so the kid picks it up from the parent. It's not that the kid was born that way. This is a learned behavior. They learn to become impatient. They learn to become rude and so on and so forth. So let us not... You know, look upon this lightly. Okay, so we've spoken about that. We've also uh, talked briefly about the choice of school. And I think, um, you know, this is a point that for the vast majority, inshallah ta'ala, it is quite clear. Okay? Our children's education is extremely important. There's no two ways about that at all. However, at the same time, times have changed whether it be in the West or it be in a Muslim country like here in, in Malaysia or in Saudi Arabia or any other Muslim country. Times have changed. People's values have changed. And so many of us end up looking for an alternative to the public school system or the government school system because there's not as much focus on moral values and so forth. If 
And, you know, this is the case, I'm, I'm, I'm talking particularly in North America, and I'm sure it may be the case here as well with some. I mean, if a person has no choice but to send the child to a government school. So a private school is out of the question, perhaps because of finances. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Listen, it is not for everybody. If Allah has restricted my income, Alhamdulillah. I do what I can afford. But don't make your children your enemies by taking out bank loans to educate them in an Islamic school. That is like a total contradiction. I'll pay interest so that my child can have an Islamic education. At the same time, I've waged war against Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's a losing battle, right? So if I can't afford it, I can't afford it. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Homeschooling is not an option for some. Why? Because, again, let's live very practically. Either because the parent who is at home doesn't have the patience or doesn't have the ability to carry out the program with the child or because both parents have to work. A fact of life for some families again. So there are no options other than sending them to a government school or a public school. If that is the only option, then along with the dua and everything else that we talked about and being the best example in the home. See, once you set a good example at home and you have trained your children when they go outside, when they go to a school, a public school for example, they will be able to decipher what is right and what is wrong. As a matter of fact, they will come to you and they, they will say, Mom, Dad, you, can't, you won't believe what some of these kids are doing. So they will be able to identify the wrong behavior there. Okay? The other thing that is important is follow up. We follow up on our child's homework. Child comes home, we want to know what do they do in terms of homework. What is the next assignment? When are exams? All of that is fine and dandy. There's nothing wrong with that. But what about asking our children and teaching them in the way that we ask them, what is the priority? Now what if you ask them all of that and as an afterthought, and by the way, did you pray Zohar at school? What is that telling the child? That homework is important. Salah, yeah, if I prayed, dad may even forget to ask me. But homework, they never forget to ask me. In a, in a government school setting where there are non-Muslim children and there's not necessarily any kind of supervision of the child that they have to go and pray, yeah, you have to be conscious of these things. Not to sit the child down and make it an inquisition every day, but at the dinner table, in conversation, you know, uh, as a reminder, and oh, so how many kids came for Salat al-Dhuhr today in the surah, you know, at the school, that sort of thing. So making sure that they have prayed, uh, asking them about their friends, because the friends that they keep are important to you and are important to me as a parent. Uh, and this is a huge thing. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam told us about the, the company that we keep, you will become like those that you hang out with. So you as a parent want to know who your child's friends are. You want to know something about them. It is a difficult one, but it is absolutely necessary. How many children end up doing things because of the influences around them? The hadith of the perfume merchant and the blacksmith where the Prophet ﷺ told us that, you know, the example that he gave is uh, of a good companion and a bad companion. The good companion is like the perfume merchant. If you were friends with a perfume merchant, you'd always smell something nice, even if you didn't buy. You'd always be in a surrounding where you smell something nice and some of that good smell would end up coming to you. It would be absorbed by your clothing. So it's always positive. And the blacksmith, even if you're not you know, using the bellows yourself, you're hanging out with the blacksmith, some of the sparks will fall on you, may damage your clothing. Some of the soot, the black uh, smoke will come on your clothing, your breathing. Ah, so there's an, there's an influence. Remember the hadith of the one who killed a hundred people. The advice 
of the wise scholar was leave this place change your environment and the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam told us that we will be upon the way of our close friends so let each and every one of you be careful as to whom they are close to whom they keep as friends yes you must do it otherwise there could be dire consequences later on from the outset remind your kids to choose good friends ask them the names of their friends find out about those friends by all means call them over so you can have first-hand experience with those kids as, a, as, as parents mashallah tabarakallah you're smart you can you can you can judge after a few times you'll be able to tell what type of what type of child that is all right building self-esteem it's very important if you keep telling your child they're good for nothing if you keep telling your child that he or she is a loser if you keep telling your child that they're so bad what do you think that's going to do for their self-esteem when they do something wrong, the first response isn't, Oh God, can't you do anything? Can't you do anything right? What is wrong with you? How did your mom raise you? Dad's going to say, how did your mom raise you? And mom's going to say, how did your dad raise you? These are not the types of words we use. What about dua for the children? You know, some of us use words that are curse words. And we don't realize that what if we said those words what if I wish you were dead ah. what if you uttered those words at a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to grant everybody the dua they asked for this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said la tad'u ala awladikum don't pray against your children Make it a habit. Instead of saying, you know, in Arabic, some of them, you know, their, their, their tongues run wild. Allah yal'anak. Allah yal'an abuk. They have this tendency of, of cursing. May Allah curse you. May Allah curse your dad. And this is the dad who is, who is, saying, who is saying these words. You're praying not only against your child, but against yourself. How, you know, but rather, what about us accustoming ourselves to the words "Allahu Yahdik"? May Allah guide you. Allah Yuslihak. May Allah correct you. May Allah rectify your affairs. These are the types of du'a we should be saying. Ghafar Allahu Lak. May Allah forgive you. Du'a for them and not against them. And when our children do something wrong, the the first reaction should not be violence. The first reaction should not necessarily be scolding. No. What about sitting them down and explaining to them? Children are not born knowing everything. And children will not necessarily learn from the first time that you tell them. You and I. How many times have, have we been told that something is wrong? Maybe that it is haram, but we still do it. We need to be reminded over. وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ this is why we have been told to remind one another because reminders benefit benefit the believers good manners and then inshallah ta'ala will break good manners refers to so many things okay so we you know we, we talk about adab and don't rely and this is a, a, a mistake that we make don't rely on the Islamic school or the ustad that comes to your house for an hour a day or a couple hours a week to teach our kids good manners and think that that is sufficient. No. You and I as parents have to be regular with our kids and we have to continue reminding them. Good manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, good manners with one another, all of this is included when we speak about adab and akhlaq. That before they eat, they say Bismillah or Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. They say this dua before they eat. That they eat with their right hands. That they eat and they're neat when they eat and they're not messy. I don't care if you have a maid at home or not. That's not what it's about. 
See, the Prophet ﷺ, he was sitting and eating from a plate with, with a young boy. And that boy was, you know, his hands were everywhere in the plate. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't do what some of us might do, smack the kid upside the head or say, hey, idiot, like, how could you do that? That's so gross, so disgusting. Nothing of that nature. Ya ghulam. Ya ghulam. Oh, young boy. When you want to eat, begin with Allah's name. Eat with your right hand and eat from what is in front of you. In other words, don't be messy when you are eating. Right? Because kids are smart too. When you tell your kid, just eat from what is in front of you, say, but the rice is in front and the chicken is in the back. So what do I do? Say, no, I mean, don't be messy. When you eat, you know, pick from the top of the chicken or the side, from one side. The rice, don't start in the middle. Start on the side. And, there, and, and explain to them why. Number one, it's neat. It's clean. And number two, in case there's anything left over, look how easy it is. We'll just scoop away where your hands were touching and the rest can be put away and we can eat it again. Oh yeah. We need to teach our kids these good manners with food and not that, oh, what you can't eat, we just throw it away while other people are starving. Right? We teach them what to say after they finish eating. We teach them about cleaning their hands after they eat. We teach them what to say before they sleep. We teach them to say, Inshallah. We teach them to say, Allah. And when these words and when these terminologies are used, we teach them how to respect adults that don't wait for an adult to begin the salam with you. You initiate the salam. When there's an adult, how do you say salam? Don't look away. Look in their eyes. Shake their hands firmly. And you be the first to say salam to them. This is all from the manners that you want to teach them. And of course, besides us doing it with others, because this is one way that we are teaching them, we also have to tell them. These are things that we need to, uh, we need to train them with. All right, so what we're going to do is, inshallah ta'ala, we'll break for a while. Uh, I apologize if it's been uh, too long and I'm boring you. But we break for a while, help yourself to some snacks in the back, and then we'll come back and I'll leave some time for your input. And uh, we'll continue with the Allah Ta'ala.